Well, hey, we are uh, kicking off or continuing in our series, Sex, Money, and Power. So would you guys say that with me on the count of three? One, two, three, Sex, Money, and Power. Uh, this is a four-part series. We're in week three. We'll wrap it up next week, uh, where we're looking at how sex, money, and power interact with our daily lives, and we're really offered a better way to interact with these things through the teachings of Jesus. Uh, if you weren't with us last week, we talked about sex, and it was a t- fun, fun time, and Today, we're going to talk about money. And before you freak out about, you know, a pastor talking about money, maybe you're new and you're like, oh my gosh, like what's this guy going to do? Don't worry. There's no ask at the end of this message. There are no kids to sponsor at the end of this time. This is really an opportunity for us to talk about something that we need to talk about because money impacts every single one of us. And, and I love talking about sex. I love talking about money. Uh, I really love talking about these things because I grew up in a home uh, where these things were kind of discussed uh, pretty normally. In fact, I find it interesting that usually the homes that we grow up, in, grow up in, the things that our parents are most ashamed about are the things they never teach us about. Uh, and I was uh, blessed to have some pretty incredible parents. I made a joke last week that my first sex talk with my dad was one sentence in 30 minutes of silence. And while that was true, um, about a year later, uh, I started dating a girl who I'm now married to, uh, Stacy. And before our first date, uh, my dad called me into his room. My mom was there. And he said, son, I know that you're starting this new relationship. I know that you're going to feel a lot of different emotions. Uh, you're a teenager. There's a lot of hormones involved in this thing. And he said, so I know that you're going to want to kiss Stacy at some point. So at some point in your relationship where you get to that point, I want to show you what an appropriate kiss is for a 15 or 16-year-old boy. And so he kissed my mom, and I was like, all right, that's cool. And then he said, and because I love you, I also want to show you what kind of kiss is inappropriate. And then he French kissed my mother for way too long (laughs) um, in front of me. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I've been going to counseling for a decade because of that. Um, I was like, Dad, why did you do that? And I was like, that's, that's like horrifying. And he's like, son, I know that this is something you'll never forget. And when you feel that moment where you just want to go a little bit further with Stacy, I want you to have me seared in your mind. <laughs> And so I've grown up with incredible parents, uh, and, and they've been incredible when it comes to, to kind of helping us navigate sexuality, and especially what we're talking about today. I feel like I was just blessed in such a significant way because my family has talked about and discussed money and stewardship since as early as I can remember. I knew how much money my dad was making uh, when I was in middle school. My parents involved me in the process of kind of learning how to handle money at a very young age. In fact, uh, when say. I got married. Most parents, right, like give like a wedding gift to their kids. My dad said, son, I'm not giving you a wedding gift unless you do something. I was like, dad, I just got married. I should just get a gift for that. And he said, no, uh, that's, that, that was easy. He said, I'll give you a gift, but your gift is contingent upon you funding a Roth IRA. I was 21 and I was like, what's a Roth IRA? And my father was like, the gateway to your freedom. And so... Um, <laughs> That's my dad. That's my mom. That's the the family that I've grown up in. So I've been really blessed to be able to put into practice some financial rhythms and routines that have really freed up my family to be able to live a pretty pretty incredible and a pretty free uh, financial life. And so today, I love talking about money because I know not all of us had that kind of conversation uh, with our parents. And what's interesting is that if you look at the New Testament documents, the stories of Jesus, you'll find this, that Jesus talks more about money than he does heaven and hell combined. Isn't that crazy? Uh, What's nuts even beyond that is that Jesus never asked for money in any of his teachings, to which you might be saying, exactly, pastor, be a follower of Jesus and stop asking for money, right? To which I would say, I get what you're saying, but Jesus never had sex and y'all are doing that, all right? So uh, let's just have a little bit of a kind of give and take on that conversation. So here's the thing, all right? Jesus' teaching on money is not about what he wants from you, but what he wants for you. Jesus doesn't want your money. He wants something far more valuable. And Jesus knew that money would be the primary competitor for what he wants most. Would you say these words with me? One, two, three. Our heart. That's what God is after. He's after our heart. And you might be saying, well, if God's after my heart, you don't need to worry about money being a competitor, right? How can something compete for my heart when I don't feel like I have any money? It's funny, right? We always think that rich people are those people, right? Rich people are never 
us. It's just the other people in our lives. And if you don't feel rich personally, I would really encourage you to go take 10 seconds at some point today to go to globalrichlist.com and to put in what your household income is, including your benefits. And you might find that you're richer than you think. In fact, uh, you are in the top 1% of earners in the world uh, if you make $32,500 a year combined, all right? So why don't you turn to somebody and say, oh, you rich, rich. Go ahead and tell them real quick. You rich, rich. Yeah. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. You might be like, well, I don't make 32.5. Okay. If you make about half of that, you're in the top 2% of wage earners in the world. If you have a vehicle that you have access to, you are in the top 4% of the wealthiest people in the world. We are rich. We just don't feel rich because of what we're going to talk about today. Because internally, we can begin to believe the lie, and we've all thought this before, that a little bit, anytime you see this word, just say it with me, more money will solve our biggest problems, right? Haven't you thought that before? If I just had a little bit more, then everything would be, if I just had a little bit more, then we'd finally be able to. But the point is that when we begin to live in the world of more, we actually begin to hurt ourselves and our soul. Because we begin, whether or not we realize it or not, to worship a little G God, something that we call an idol, that we believe in some ways is going to give us something it can never give us. Things become an idol, that's the word we've been using in this series, in our life when we ask something to do for us. That what only God can do. And so here's the deal. Uh, when we begin to think internally that money is going to be able to give us comfort, it's become an idol in our life. If you ever had this thought or have this kind of internalized thought, if I could just make a little bit more, then we'd finally be financially secure. You, you might have uh, an issue that you need to work through. Uh, if I just had a little bit more, then we'd be able to live in this neighborhood. Then we'd be able to go to this place. Then, then I'd finally feel like a success. You know, it's funny that a lot of men and women find their value and their identity from their net worth. And we pursue this thing thinking it's going to give us the approval we need. And then we find that we're always feeling a little bit empty no matter how much we have. Or control. I love this one, especially like if you're a parent, right? There's so many of us that believe this lie. If I just made a little bit more money, then I would be able to get my kid into the pre, 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 preschool that's going to really form them into the genius I just know they are, and they're going to get the scholarship to Harvard, right? Like that's the way that we think about it. Or, right, in the athletic space, uh, if I just had a little bit more money, then we could get our kid into that really good club where they'll finally be, you know, the world's greatest soccer player. Player, right? Mental note, the U.S. is never going to produce great soccer players. <laughs> like, find another dream, all right? And this is what we do with money. We believe in our mind, this, this little lie, if I just had a little bit more, then we'd be comfortable. Then I'd find approval. Then I'd be in control. And the problem, really, hear me today, the problem is not money. It's our insatiable desire for more. More. And we've all got it in us. You think what's interesting is that we all have a little bit of greedy in us, if we're honest. I don't have to teach my sons uh, the word more or the word mine. Like they got those figured out by themselves, right? Why is that? Because inside of us is this sense that if we just have a little bit more, then we'd finally be fine. And then we get it and then we realize, well, we just need a little bit more. And we get on a crazy train. Here's the thing, though. Uh, you and I don't tend to think of ourselves as greedy, and so we do one of two things to help kind of deal with that. We, we usually deal with our greed in one of two ways. For some of us, we deal with it through entitlement, okay? Uh, and what's interesting living in a community like the one that we live in uh, is that there are some people that really experience this. The average household income uh, in Lake Nona, according to the Orlando Sentinel a couple of years ago, was about $140,000, making it the third wealthiest zip code in our city, right? And so there are people that have significant amount of resource and are making far more than that that are a part of our church. And the other thing that's interesting about the context that we're in uh, is that there are people that are working in vocational missions or working for a nonprofit or kind of in my line of work who, who are not making that kind of resource. And so we all kind of throw each other in a room and we're trying to figure out life together. And what we need to know is both of us have the same problem. We just work through it in different ways. So some of us uh, are dealing with our greed through a process of entitlement. And what that means is we take things that are wants and turn them into needs. I need this $6 hot cafe latte for my soul, right? I need 
the new iPhone, even though my other iPhone is working just fine. I need a newer car. Honey, I know that we just bought the house, but we need a newer house. I, I know that one looks like a barn, like on HGTV, but I just want a bigger barn. That's what I want, honey. I need all the shiplap, right? Like that's the way in which we work in our lives. And here's what we've got to understand. That's actually greed just working itself out through entitlement. But there's a whole other group of people that I need to talk to today, particularly because of where our church is located. And that's those of us who spiritualize our middle classness. Those of us who act like we are better because we wouldn't spend our money that way, right? We put, a, put an idol and we kind of value the idea of frugality as if Jesus said, thou shall be cheap. Like that, there's nowhere in the Bible <laughs> where that's the case. And this is important, Okay. Because unknowingly, we can become judgmental people who say, if I had that much money, I wouldn't spend it that way. I wouldn't go on those trips. Mental note, it is really, really easy to say what decisions you would make in the situation, uh, if you were in that situation, when there's never an option for you to be in that financial space. It's kind of like when I, before I had kids, I'd get on an airplane and I'd hear little kids screaming and I'd be like, oh my gosh, those parents are terrible, right? And now, and now I walk into a plane with my four kids and I'm just like, deal with it, y'all, right? Like that's the way it works. <laughs> so understand that this is a real thing. And Jesus offers us a different way. He says this in Matthew 6, 24. He says, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And look what Jesus says. He says you can't serve both God and money. He, Jesus is not saying money's bad. He's just saying when you make money an ultimate thing, you make God a lesser thing. And you've got to choose and make a decision in your own heart about what you're going to prioritize and what you are going to value. Jesus is basically saying you will either learn to master money or money will master you. And so to create a little bit of common ground today, I want to kind of walk us through a little test that I think is helpful for us. Uh, you might be mastered by money if, right now, you're carrying consumer debt, because it's probably an indicator uh, that you don't have the self-control that you need to be able to say no to the things you need to say no to and yes to the things that you ought to say yes to. Uh, and that's a lot of people in America. Did you know more people spend money on their uh, minimum payments and the interest on their consumer credit card debt than they do in charitable giving a year? It's crazy. You might be mastered by money if you're worried about money, if you find yourself thinking about it a lot, waking up, thinking about it, checking the bank account multiple times, scheming all of the time, being anxious about your dollars and cents, you might be mastered by money. You might be mastered by money if you're staying at a job. You know you should leave. It's not good for you. It's not good for the family. It's not good for your own health. But you're just so committed to the check that you've got to stay there and you compromise yourself. You might be mastered by money if you're asking, especially if you're a religious person, what's the minimum I have to give to be good with God, right? If that's the question you're asking, you might be mastered by money. And you definitely are mastered by money if you're having an argument with me in your head right now, all right? <laughs> Jesus offers a different way. There's a million different passages we could look at today where Jesus teaches about money, but there's one in particular that I think helps us really find freedom from this idol worship that we can be experiencing without even knowing we're doing it. It's found in Luke chapter 12, verse 13 to 21. Jesus is spending uh, the first part of Luke chapter 12 and then afterward talking about foolish people and wise people. And in the midst of this conversation he's having with a large crowd, Luke, who was an investigative journalist, interviewed hundreds of eyewitnesses who knew Jesus and put together a, an academic kind of chronology of events of Jesus' life, records this story. Well, while Jesus is talking to a crowd, a man interrupts him and says this. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, you've got to stop here. Uh, in the first century, uh, when a father passed away, the oldest son got 100% of the inheritance in the estate. And it was the responsibility of the older brother to delegate resources to the rest of the family so that everyone would be taken care of. So apparently in this situation, either the older brother has not done that and he's kept it all for himself, or he has done that and the younger brother is not happy with the piece of the pie that he got. So in this public setting with Jesus teaching, he's like, hey, I'm going to ask Jesus to tell my brother to do something better. And Jesus' response is great. He doesn't actually say that. Instead, Jesus says, man... And I love that, right? We tend to think that Jesus is like super spiritual with every word he said, right? It's not like man, right? He's like, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? 
He's basically saying there are other places for you to go and figure that out. But Jesus takes this private dispute that the brothers are having, and he turns it into a public conversation that all of us can resonate with. And this is what Jesus does. Jesus takes a moment to help us all get an insight into the power money can have in our life when we ask it to give us comfort, approval, or control. Jesus then said, beware. That word beware means pay specific attention to. Beware. And then he says, guard against, I love this phrase, every kind of greed. It's as if Jesus knows that there are different kinds of greed. Yeah, there's the greed of the, you know, large corporations that exploit people and and get big bonuses. Yeah, there's that kind of greed. But there's also the greed of the mama who's staying at home, who's rocking her old navy leggings, and she's got her girlfriends with her new Lululemons, and there's something inside of her that gets a little upset about it, you know? Or the guy who, you know, sees somebody else get the promotion at work, and and it's not him or it's not her. Or or you're scrolling through Instagram or social media. You know those people that always have the perfect family with the perfect vacations, then you kind of hope something not perfect happens to them, right? You know, those kinds of things. And all of that is greed. It's a desire to want a different life than the one that we have. And Jesus says, guard. Guard against that. Because the more you want a different life than the one that God has given you, the more likely you are to miss out on enjoying the one you have. So Jesus says, guard against every kind of greed. So here's what I want to do for the next few moments. I just want to be really practical and help us answer this question. How do we guard against greed? Well, Jesus continues on, and he says this. He says, life, life, this time we have together, is not measured by how much you own. In other words, your worth is not your net worth. You are worth far more than that. Your significance is not connected to what, how many zeros are in the bank account, what zip codes you live in, or what letters are behind your name. You are so much more and valuable to God than that. So here's what I'd encourage you to write down in your notes. If you want to guard against greed, replace money and status with faithfulness as your measurement for success. Jesus tells another story in Matthew uh, chapter 25 where, he, where one man is given five talents. That's a, a sum of money. Another man's given three talents, and then one guy's given one. And the guy who has five and the guy who has three goes and multiplies that and doubles what he's been given. The other guy buries it in the sand, and then when the master comes back to collect, uh, the guy who buries it in the sand shows up and says, I didn't do anything with it. And, and, and Jesus says, the master calls him, and the master in the story is God, wicked and lazy. Mental note, you don't want God calling you wicked and lazy, right? But to the two other guys who took what they had been given and actually did something with it, this is what God says to them. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Here's a question I think we all have to ask. Am I doing the best I can with what I've been given? You know, my grandmother had a third grade education uh, when, when she kind of moved to the island of Bermuda. Never got to go to school beyond that. And what she did with what she was given was create a platform for me and for my future family to be able to pursue an education that she could never get. She multiplied her resources. I have the responsibility now, as her grandson, to do something with what I've been given. Our measurements for life are different because we've been given different things. Are you tracking with me? And the same thing is true with you. Your life is not measured by what you do. Your life is measured by what you do with what's been given to you. And some of us have a whole lot more than what we've actually been stewarding well. The story goes on, and Jesus then tells a story. He says this. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build big, pay attention to this, er ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it. Eat drink, and be merry. So Jesus is telling a story. And it's about a man who happens on this particular year to have an abundance of harvest that is way more than what he was expected or needed. And now he's got a a conundrum. What do I do with all this extra resource that I've been given? Let me ask you a question real quick. Just give me a head nod. 
If, I, if you were to walk out of this place with an extra $100,000, how many of you would be like, that was a great Sunday, praise Jesus. Anybody, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, right? What would you do? What would you do with that 100K? See, the man didn't have an answer ahead of time about what he was going to do with what had been given to him. So he did what all of us tend to do, which is to live in the land of Ur. Would you all say Ur with me? Say Ur. When you and I get excess, when we don't have a plan, we intend to live in the land of Ur. So write this second thing down. Decide ahead of time what enough will be. Decide ahead of time what enough will be. Because if you don't have a plan, you'll always drift into the land of Ur. Nice Ur, big Ur, new Ur. And the problem with that is not that those things are necessarily bad. It's just that those things begin to compete for our hearts all the more. The teachings of Jesus are really, really simple. You should have a plan for how you're going to use the money that has been given to you. Here's the question. What is my plan to make sure money doesn't become my master? If you don't have a plan to master your money, your money will master you. I have the benefit of growing up in a family where my, my parents taught me the plan I'm about to lay out before you. And the plan that my parents taught me is a plan that I got to see them live out in real time, and it has radically changed my life. Uh, a decade of doing this in marriage, and Stacey and I are in a financial position where we have a ton of freedom because we've impl- implemented the principles that our parents taught us that Jesus and that the Bible is clear about as well. In fact, we're going to look at a couple of Proverbs written by a man named King Solomon. King Solomon writes the book of Proverbs because he's a wealthy man who's entrusting his young sons with resource and wealth, and he teaches them how to manage money. And this is what you find. The first thing is this. If you want to have a good plan, plan to be free of greed, you start here. Giving first honors God. Write that down. Giving first honors God. Proverbs 3, 9 says this, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. So there's this illustration here, right? We've got the crop illustration in Proverbs, and then we've got the crop illustration in Jesus' teaching. This man gets excess crops, and instead of honoring God with the first fruits, he builds a bigger place to store the stuff that he doesn't need already. It is so easy for us to become people that get consumed by more, thinking more is going to protect us. But when you give first to God, it reminds you that everything you have is not from you. It is from God alone. Giving honors God. And you might be saying, well, well, is is this you trying to convince me to give to the church? Give where your heart leads you to give. We think the local church is an incredible place because we make a huge impact in the world. But at the end of the day, my concern is that many of us aren't even giving at all because we're not living this this way. We're spending more money on debt servicing interest than we are being charitable to other people. You give first because it honors God and because it frees you up. Here's the second thing. Saving second builds wealth. Hear me clear as day because there's some terrible teaching out there uh, in churches that that I really think are, are, are trying to guilt people, okay, if I'm honest with you. Look here. Jesus is not anti-wealth. Jesus is anti-greed. Jesus is not anti-wealth. He is anti-greed. So we give first to honor God. And you might be saying, well, how much do I give, Pastor? Old Testament said 10%. There's not, a, not any rules in the, in the New Testament. Well, there is actually this story where Jesus encounters, you know, a young rich man. And the rich man says, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, have you kept the law? He says, yes. And then Jesus says, great, sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. So the Old Testament ethic is 10%. The New Testament ethic is 100%. So when people ask me, how much should I give, Pastor? I think somewhere between 10 to 100% is great. (laughs) For my family, that number looks like somewhere between 10 to 15 and sometimes even more than that. But we pre-decide that at least, at least, at least 10 to 15% off the top of our resources are going to go to God and his work first. The second one is saving second builds wealth. Uh, Proverbs 13, 22 says this, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. I saw this verse last week and I went to my dad after church. And I said, dad, are you a good man? <laughs> hey, we want to be thinking ahead, don't we? We want to be thinking ahead, not just for our kids, but for our future kids. Do you have a plan to save? Proverbs 21, 20 says, the wise store up choice food and oil, but fools gulp theirs down. I love that phrase, gulp theirs down. 
uh, because of what I'm about to uh, share with you right now. Um, if you're in your 20s, pay attention to what I'm saying. And if you are old, which means you're not in your 20s, uh, when, when I get to this point, when I get to this point where you hear me say something that you agree with, just give me the most gospel church amen you have in you, okay? All right? All right. I ain't even gotten there yet, but okay, here we go. Did you know, <laughs> did you know the average millennial person in their 20s and 30s spends $2,008 a year on coffee? So when millennials tell me I'm broke, I'm like, nah, you're just highly caffeinated, all right? That's what you are. It's nuts, isn't it? It's crazy. So here's the thing, okay? If you're in your 20s, pay attention. I'm going to help you out, all right? Did you know if you took that $2,000 a year and put it in a retirement account that is tax deferred, something like a Roth IRA, and you do that over the next 30 years, let's say conservatively that grows at 8%, compounding interest is God's gift to us, that that $2,000 a year that you would set aside would turn into $271,000 30 years from now? That's at 8%. Last year, my mutual funds did 33%. But go ahead and enjoy that latte, all right? Come on. Come on. Look here. Look here. It's not just a 20s thing. For some of you, it's your golf game. For some of you, it's the fact that you're continuing to lease cars, and the moment you drive them off the lot, you are throwing money away. For others of us, for others of us, it looks like the fact that we have to go do retail therapy to deal with the fact that there's a deeper longing in our soul. And as a result of that, we are setting ourselves up for failure. And Jesus invites us into a better way. For others of us, it's the fact that we still have a cable TV subscription so we can watch the one channel we want, which is HGTV, which just convinces us more and more and more we need a better house than the one we've got. So giving first honors God. Saving second builds wealth. And thirdly, living off the rest teaches contentment. My family takes great vacations. I take my wife on incredible dates. We have nice stuff. And I don't feel bad for it for one moment. Because we give first, save second, and live off the rest. The problem in our culture is that we have this whole thing flipped. So we live first. And living first doesn't create contentment, it creates consumerism and eventually credit card debts. We save when we can, which means we never have enough and that's why we're always anxious and stressed out. And we give when we feel guilty, which is God's, not God's intention for us. The scripture says God loves a cheerful giver. If a person that you loved was standing on a train track and facing you, and there was a train coming full speed ahead, and they didn't see it. Would you yell at them to get off the track? Or would you run as fast as you could to push them off the track to save their life? I'd probably do both. So let me yell at you and run at you. If you are living a live first, save when you can, give when you're guilty life, there is a freight train coming, and you need to get off of it. Because there's a better way to live. And you don't even need to follow Jesus for this to be practical and helpful. There's a better way to live. There's a way to live where you get to the joy of being able to give to things you care about. Save for your future and live in freedom. It's the reason why so many marriages, the primary thing people are arguing about is money. And I want you to have a better marriage than that. I want you to have the kind of marriage that I have right now. We're on Monday. I woke up with a clear dream and sense in my heart that my, my family, we were going to give a car away to somebody. And I called my wife about three hours later and said, honey, I just feel like God's calling us to give away a car. And her response was nothing more than, man, if that's what God's calling us to do, I'm right there with you. Why? Because we give first, save second, and live off the rest. Luke continues and he says, but God said to him, this guy who stores up everything, living in the land of Ur, living in the land of Moore, thinking more is going to give him comfort, more is going to give him approval, more is going to give him control, loses control, isn't going to have comfort. He says, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? 
Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Look here. It is foolish to ask money to do what only a rich relationship with God can do. It is foolish to ask money to give you comfort when the comfort you ultimately long for is only found in a deep relationship a rich relationship with your Heavenly Father. It is foolish to ask money to give you some sense of approval and value and significance when the creator of the universe has already determined how valuable you are by dying on your behalf. You're worth something. So who cares what the other mom thinks or what the PTA thinks or what the people in your neighborhood think? It doesn't matter because you have the approval of the creator of the universe. It is foolish to ask money to give us some sense of control when in all reality it ends up controlling us. And the best way for you to experience freedom is to surrender control to the one who's ultimately in control. And so the question for all of us is this. What are you asking money to do right now for you that only God can do? What are you asking money to do for you that only God can do? There is a pathway to freedom. And it is clear. Give first because it honors God. Save second because it builds wealth. And live off the rest because it teaches contentment. And each step of the way, you'll find that God is really all you need for comfort. And God is really all you need for approval. And God is ultimately where control is going to be found in your surrender. Tim Keller, in his book, Counterfeit Gods, talking about idols says this. He says, when you see Jesus dying to make you his treasure, that will make him yours. I love that. That Jesus left the treasures of heaven to make me and you his treasures forever. Keller says, money will cease to be the currency of your significance and security, and you'll want to bless others with what you have. Man, to the degree that you grasp the gospel, gospel, good news, that Jesus has lived life you cannot live, died a painful death on all of our behalf, defeated death to make us right before the creator of the universe. When you grasp this unconditional grace, money, money will have no dominion over you. It won't be your master anymore. Just think on his costly grace. That's the unconditional love of God that says no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, where you've been, or what's been done to you, Jesus says you are welcome in my family. Think on his costly grace until it changes you into a generous people. We give first because God God gave first. We save because God's the one who saves us. And we live with contentment because no matter how much we have, no matter where we live, and no matter what happens, we are the beloved. Come here, look here. You are the beloved of God. And there is no better place to be than in a rich relationship with him. So don't let money be a cheap imitation of the real thing. And let's find our comfort and our approval and our control and the only one who can actually give us those things. Our Savior, Jesus.